so while we're waiting, um, one of the things that I would like to mention is that we will have an open Q&A this evening. We have a, a fantastic um, guest speaker on today or tonight. And um, so ask your questions. Um, she's a wealth of information. On the Zoom platform, you'll notice there's a Q&A button. It's great if you can ask, if you can click there, ask your question. This uh, creates a recording of your question. And then if we miss anything, we can always go back and, and send you an email to answer. But we'll try to get to all the questions tonight. So let me tell you a little bit about our speaker for this evening. Um, Leslie Stevens has actually been involved in the world of pediatric sleep, breathing, and airway health for over 35 years. As CEO and President of Healthy Start, Leslie is an international lecturer and trainer. And I really, I don't think there's a question in the reference to the subject of pediatric sleep, breathing, and airway health and Healthy Start's connection that she cannot answer. And really, when you have the backing of a company like Healthy Start by Orthotain, you have over 52 years, over 4 million cases, and tons of research to back you. Now, most importantly, Leslie is the mother of three. So her goal and desire is to provide every advantage for children to allow them to live healthy and happy lives. One of the things you're gonna learn tonight is that there is a silent epidemic affecting nine out of 10 children. And this epidemic manifests itself in a variety of symptoms that can be easily overlooked, misdiagnosed, and most unfortunately left untreated. It's critical that children are evaluated for sleep and breathing habits. Leslie's mission is to educate both dental professionals as well as parents to ensure children a lifetime of health, happiness, and success. So I'd actually like to take this time to hand the floor and the mic over to Leslie Stevens. Well, thank you so much, Susie. And I am absolutely um, delighted to um, be here and be able to spend the evening with you. Um, maybe, Susie, you can allow me to share the screen. Um, so I can get on and we'll get started and I am looking forward to a great evening um, and hopefully providing all of you with some very interesting information that maybe some of you have um, known something about maybe some of you have not known about this before but either way um, it's going to be a great night um, I always get very excited about um, presenting a webinar, maybe for the first time, because I'm hoping each and every one of you is going to have that aha moment tonight. Um, I, I know when I talk to other doctors, they'll tell me, I seen it, I just didn't put all the dots together. So hopefully tonight we're putting some of the dots together for you and get you started on a road to evaluating your pediatric patients and really looking at the overall health of these children. So um, tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about um, evaluating, screening, um, looking at these children to make an assessment. And the ADA has actually put out a policy, and in it, it says, and I'm going to read it because it's really important to really get the focus. In children, screening through history and clinical examination may identify signs and symptoms of deficient growth and development or other risk factors that may lead to airway issues. If risk for sleep-related breathing disorder is determined, intervention through medical dental referral, or evidence-based treatment may be appropriate to help treat the sleep-related breathing disorders and or develop an optimal physiological airway and breathing pattern. So it's critical that we're evaluating. It's critical for us to be screening. And tonight, we're going to give you some of those um, tools to allow you to do that. So how many children are really affected by sleep-related breathing disorder. Maybe a problem airway, maybe it's um, sleep-related, maybe it's breathing-related, or maybe it's all three. Um, it's estimated nine out of 10 children suffer from one or more of these outward symptoms. And these outward symptoms are clues that will indicate there are other underlying root causes that you as a dental professional can address and treat and be able to provide better health for these children. 
And these outward symptoms include mouth breathing, snoring, teeth grinding, swollen adenoids and tonsils, chronic allergies, eczema, asthma, ADD, ADHD, aggressive behavior, depression, irritability, anger, peer problems, few friends, bedwetting, difficulty in school, especially in the subjects of math, science, and spelling, delayed or stunted growth, restless sleep, nightmares, morning headaches, daytime drowsiness, frequently waking up at night, sleep talking and walking. And it, it truly, once you start observing and screening, you're going to be shocked to see how many of your patients exhibit these outward symptoms. It truly is a silent crisis among child, America's children. Currently, 40 million children just within the United States possess or exhibit these outward symptoms. It's a huge number. So typically, what are parents doing? If they do identify one of these outward symptoms, typically parents look at it as an isolated um, area or an isolated problem. For instance, asthma, allergy, ADD, ADHD. So what do parents typically do? Well, they'll go to a specialist to look at that isolated symptom. And what typically is done today? Well, we see a lot of these outward symptoms being treated with stimulant drugs, prescription drugs, psychiatric testing, counseling therapy, surgery, sleep studies, allergy testing, special education, the list goes on and on. But what these outward or these treatment protocols have in common is that they're addressing only the outward symptoms. They're only addressing the symptoms and not the root cause. Um, they tend to be short-term band-aids. They often involve several drugs with many side effects. And unfortunately, they can be costly, painful, time-consuming, and ineffective. So what if we say that looking at these outward symptoms might be related to a group of root causes that produce these outward symptoms. So the question is, what are these root causes that cause these outward symptoms? And they include mouth breathing, narrow palate, improper tongue placement, jaw relationships. Research over the past 20 years have linked each of these outward symptoms to these root causes. So what can we do? How can we screen? What, it, what do we need to do? Do we need to change things within our practice protocol? How difficult is it going to be for me to implement this? And um, I was asked to speak at the Greater New York um, just this past weekend. And um, one of the um, places I lectured, um, it was the Airway Summit. And the question was, help us with screening. Tell us what we can do, how do we implement this, and how do we make it easy? And typically the comment from the doctors is, it's so hard, I have so many things to do. It's hard to incorporate one more thing. You know, I probably have five or 10 more years of my um, practice um, and really introducing something new is hard. I, I really don't think this is an option. Knowing how many children are affected and realizing how much you as the dental professional can impact and change the trajectory, not only for a child's dental health, but more importantly, over their overall health. So tonight, it's really not a choice. I think once you know about this, it's an absolute. We should all be there evaluating not only our patients, but our own children, our family members. It's that critical and it impacts a child that dramatically, um, not only for today, but for the rest of their life. So the first area that I feel in screening is just visual. There is so much you can pick up in just evaluating or looking at your patient. So take a look, for instance, the girl on the left. Take a look at these deep circles under her eyes. We call that venous pooling. Take a look at her head posture. It's more in a forward position, meaning that she's leaning forward probably to open up her airway. It's a clue that maybe there's something a little bit more going on um, with her overall health, but also being able to identify root causes that might be causing that. If you look to the right, 
take a look at this boy that has, again, these dark circles under his eyes. Um, look at how the lips are parted. Um, you can see a rolled lip. Um, it almost looks like the neck and the lower third of his face is blending into his neck, meaning that it's probably more of a um, uh, retrusive lower third of the face rather than the ability of that child to be more in a forward um, growth pattern. So we tend to see sometimes these um, double chins. Take a look at their profile. What's very interesting is if we took a line down the forehead, you can see where the growth is lacking. We focus typically on the lower third of the face. And you can see in this particular patient, look at how retronathic that lower chin is. Look at how the lip is rolled, um, probably an overjet but that lip is interfering, preventing that lower chin from growing forward, but also um, possibly protruding those upper teeth. We need to get that lip out of there. We need to promote that forward growth. So here are deficiencies we're already going to see. Take a look at the girl on the right. Again, lower third of the face, deficient, but look at how that lower chin blends into her neck. It's one of those where we call it a funnel look, meaning that my suspect is that she has a large overjet. I see a rolled lip, meaning that it's interfering with the ability for that lower chin to be able to develop forward. Look at the circles under her eyes, again, venous pooling. So already, just looking at these children, we realize that there is much more going on. Here's an important tool that Healthy Start can provide to your practice. What makes this so unique is that not only are these 27 of the most prevalent outward symptoms of sleep, but we're gonna ask a parent to give them a severity rating from zero to five, five being the most pronounced. And what this becomes is a learning tool for the parent, but also providing you with additional information um, to have a better idea of what's going on with that child, especially at night when they sleep. So when you're talking to a parent, typically the conversation is, what would mouth breathing, bedwetting, have to do with dentistry. And the question is, these are outward symptoms that many times can be a result of underlying root causes that are affecting the ability for your child to develop properly, your child to um, gain the proper oral habits, eliminate the improper habits, and provide a wide and forward growth during their development years. And Starting that conversation helps a parent understand how impactful it is for that child during these years, but how important it is to begin this at an early age or as soon as we basically um, are able to identify these outward symptoms. Take a look at the last one. It says number 27, speech problems. Um, this has been so fascinating. Um, this past summer, um, really spent a lot of time focusing on speech problems and um, found it incredibly interesting that I didn't realize 67% of the consonant sounds that children develop begin either in two places. One is in the palate of the mouth and the other is in the lip seal. And these children that have these sleep issues tend to be deficient in both of those areas. So speech problems are, are very closely related to sleep problems. So tendency is you might see them hand in hand. The other thing that's difficult for a parent is sometimes when you ask them about their child's speech, they'll say, oh no, my child is perfectly understandable. His speech and pronunciation is fine. However, when they're in the chair, you are having a very hard time understanding what that child said. So again, we kind of put on our um, delicate gloves and we start down that conversation. Um, it, it's helpful to be able to identify so parents can um, identify, but also during treatment, they're going to be seeing the progression of that child and the improvement of their speech and um, being you know, a participant with you in that evaluation. 
um, Healthy started a very interesting study of over 500 patients. And it was basically taking a look at the sleep questionnaires out of um, 500 random dental patients um, to look at and evaluate these outward symptoms. So the results of this study basically said mouth breathing and snoring are commonly associated with more sleep disorder breathing symptoms than any other symptom study. Nine out of 10 children had one or more outward symptoms of sleep disorder breathing. 60% of the sample had four or more symptoms. One out of five children experienced bedwetting. I'll stop there because that was kind of a shocker for me. I did not realize that um, it was so prevalent at a later age. I mean, obviously we don't talk about our children at a later age bedwetting. Um, it's kind of one of those little secrets that remain within the family. Um, but just kind of being aware that in a classroom of 20 kids, four of them are probably still bedwetting at a later age. So it, it's more prevalent than we have previously um, thought, and it should be something that should be just kind of in the back of your mind when you're talking to some of these families. Um, the last bullet is extremely important. Between ages 4 and 12, 92.6% of these outward symptoms will not self-correct, while 30% worsen with age. What does that mean? That means if a child is exhibiting one of these outward symptoms, they have less than an 8% chance that it will self-correct. In Vegas, that would be considered poor odds. And talking about our children, our patients, those are awful odds. So the question becomes, when you see it, you treat it. And you need to educate your parents so they're making the appropriate choices. There's nothing worse than talking to a mother of a 22-year-old and they're saying, I knew it, nobody listened to me. Um, we want you to be that type of dentist that is listening not only to your parents, but you're listening to your patient. They might not be communicating to you, um, but at least you are um, identifying and providing them with the proper information to make those assessments. So when we look at the percentages of incidents, we see that mouth breathing is the number one. And mouth breathing is a little difficult to explain to a parent because they'll typically say, <coughs> it, is it snoring? No, it's not snoring. However, if a child snores, they obviously mouth breathe. The problem is if they mouth breathe, they do not necessarily snore. And the reason why mouth breathing is so important is because if a patient just opens their mouth by a half an inch, it reduces their airway by six millimeters. So a seven-year-old only has an airway of seven millimeters, which means that just by mouth breathing, you're reducing that down to one millimeter, and that child's trying to breathe through one millimeter of airway. Well, REM sleep requires oxygen. And because a child who's a mouth breather is reducing the amount of oxygen, there's not enough oxygen to get into REM sleep. So you can imagine what REM sleep basically provides. REM sleep provides... Um, basically the restoration and the reparative um, issues that happen during the day. So within REM sleep, we're looking to maintain and grow and to um, make the endocrine, the neurological system, the hormonal systems work more properly and have the restorative sleep that you need in order to provide and to ensure that these um, areas are functioning properly. So um, when we look at these mouth breathers, we know that they will have approximately eight other outward symptoms. Um, and these outward, other outward symptoms typically are snoring, difficulty listening and often interrupting, talks while sleeping, allergic symptoms, fidgets with their hands, restless sleep, teeth grinding, feel sleepy or irritable during the day. So, what are the implications of this study? Well, the findings show that sleep disorder breathing is much more common and affects children even as young as two years of age. Begin treatment as early as possible to ensure permanent changes. 
Identifying outward symptoms displayed in 90% of the children that enter your practice can significantly reduce this epidemic and enable you to successfully treat the overall health of your patients. So let's talk about airway. What is airway? Why is this such a big deal? How do we promote growth of the airway? And how does habitual air issues impact the ability um, for a child to have an effective airway? So when we talked about mouth breathing, reducing the airway by one, um, by six millimeters, leaving a seven-year-old with a one millimeter airway, a good visual for a parent is one millimeter of an airway is approximately the size of a coffee stirrer. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to breathe through a coffee stirrer, but um, as I do with all the appliances, I want to experience what our patients are experiencing. So I took it upon myself that one day I was going to spend the entire day breathing through a coffee stirrer. Well, I made it about 10 minutes, maybe 15, and I'll tell you I had the worst headache I've ever had. Um, I tried Excedrin, I tried eating, I tried everything to get rid of that headache and I just couldn't. It wasn't until I went to sleep that night and woke up the following morning did that headache go away, which was great for me, but thinking about a child who does mouth breathing each and every night, they never have the opportunity to go to sleep and restore themselves and eliminate the headache that maybe they were experiencing during the day. So we have to kind of put ourselves in our children's and our patients' position and realize the difficulty and the struggles they might be occurring without you even knowing about it or them not having the ability to explain to you or verbalize what they're feeling. What is the goal? The goal for the airway is something similar to a garden hose. We want to expand that airway to give them the ability to have as fully developed airway to provide the proper amount of oxygen, um, the ability for um, the airway to be forward, the growth to be forward, and the expansion um, of their airway. Another way to look at it is when we look at an airway, if it had 100% airflow, say for instance for a seven-year-old, which we um, indicated was about seven millimeters diameter, Take a look at the little boy on the right, and you can see the example of what that airway should look like. Typically, we say it looks almost the same size of the pinky of the child's finger. Now, if that child is a mouth breather, we know that 100% flow, airflow, is going to be reduced down to one millimeter. That one millimeter is so small. Obviously, it's only 11% of the airflow. So you can imagine how difficult it is for that child to obviously get enough oxygen, but enough oxygen as well to get into REM sleep. Why is this problem happening? Well, unfortunately, after the industrialization, um, a lot of things changed. Um, our diet changed. It's softer. We don't use our oral cavity as well to start expanding the arches. Um, we realized that typically both parents work. So it's difficult for mothers to be breastfeeding children for two years plus. Um, I always say be a little careful when we bring this up because every mother seems to blame themselves as this was some, some way their responsibility. And obviously this, we can't look back. We can't go back and change things. We only look forward. So we're gonna be able to provide them with the ability for their oral cavity to develop properly from this point on. We also see prolonged nipple bottle feeding and prolonged use of pacifiers impact the development of the oral cavity. And what happens is that nipple depresses the tongue. At the same time, it creates a suction in the mouth and that suction actually collapses the arches. So we tend to see narrow arches, we tend to see um, tongues that are positioned in the lower portion of the oral cavity, improper swallow, and mouth breathing. So that's kind of where we um, see the beginning of these issues. Um, we also know that just in the population, orthodontically, we know right now this generation, 92.6% of the population will have malocclusions. 
So it is a very high percentage. And yes, part of it's responsible because of the um, nipple bottle, the pacifier, lack of breastfeeding, soft diet is in there, and there might be some genetics. So it, it's definitely um, something that's not going away. And obviously, we see the percentages rising and rising. Um, what typical um, conditions can we recognize in a child? Well, obviously, looking at an open bite, mouth breathing, tongue thrusting, um, could be a result of pacifier and prolonged nipple bottle use, as well as finger sucking, thumb sucking, etc. cetera. Um, but these are some of the issues that you can identify right off the bat when you see these kids. Um, going through a little bit about where the airway is, um, nasal cavity, hard palate, soft palate, um, how the tongue plays into um, the anatomy is, is important conversation to start with the parents. So they just kind of have a basic idea of why we're talking about this and what the impact is. Um, the nose, the nose gets such a short, um, doesn't get recognized as well as it should, but the nose has five functions. And it's extremely important that we increase the ability to nasal breathe. So as um, we look at these five functions, they do include serves as an air passageway, warms and moistens inhaled air. Um, its membrane traps dust, pollen, bacteria, and other foreign matter, contains receptors which sort out odors, and it aids in pronunciation and the quality of voice. So how many times do we see a child like this that basically um, is in the car seat, mouth open, exhausted? Um, this is not what we should be seeing. Um, if you're going to a zoo and you've been there for two hours and your child is completely wiped out, that is not normal behavior. Children should be able to stay up during the daytime hours. And if you see your child seem more sleepy or a tendency to um, uh, feel exhausted, short-tempered, impulsive, things like that, Again, another indication that we should be evaluating um, a variety of different outward symptoms and possibly linking them and looking for underlying root causes. So we have Eli here, and um, I want you to take a listen because this basically um, sums up what we see, and it provides us in where we're going to head and um, why we look at the healthy start in the treatment of these children. So take a listen. Now he's holding it. That was holding it. He's still holding it. He's trying to take in air. There he goes. He's holding it, he's holding it, he's holding it. He's holding it. Still holding his breath, and I was gonna gulp again. There he goes. That was it again. And again. He's holding. He's holding. He's trying. There he goes. So this has been three minutes and fifteen seconds, and you can see how many episodes he's had of not getting calm breaths in. Now watch what happens when I take his jaw and I just bring it forward. If I can, let's see if I can. And I open his airway. Just bring his airway forward. Airway, just pulling his jaw forward ever so slightly. And now he's breathing through his nose quietly. His mouth is a little bit open, but he's breathing through his nose. This way, hear him quietly, and you don't hear him anymore. And all I did is gently bring his jaw forward. 
So how interesting is that? And I, I want you to take something away from this Eli video, and it's, it's so critical in this conversation. Um, many times when we have children that um, have sleep, breathing, or airway issues, um, maybe you've heard an orthodontist say, well, let's just expand the arches. Let's put a rapid palatal expander in there, expand the arches. That's great. Expanding the arches might be something that absolutely needs to be done. It will help with the airway, will help with the nasal breathing. But the problem is we're not addressing the other areas. For instance, um, in this example of Eli, she's bringing the lower jaw forward. Um, and why does that need to happen? Because if you open your mouth, that lower chin will drift back. What happens though, if, if the tongue is laying low, you will tend to mouth breathe. If your arches are narrow, you will not be able to put the tongue in the upper palate of the mouth. So the tongue basically should rest in your upper palate. And an interesting way to see if it's doing that is say the letter N, where that sound ends is where your tongue should be at rest. Majority of parents will say, oh my goodness, we have a problem. My tongue is not where it needs to be. So if we can expand the arches, if we can get the tongue in the right position, create the proper swallow, eliminate the mouth breathing, keep the lower gin from drifting back, and increase nasal breathing, all while developing that lower third of the face, we would have the answer. And that's exactly what Healthy Start does. We're not just a single entity. We look at the variety of root causes and we can address each one of them. And what's amazing is we're gonna use growth and development to be able to promote those changes. We're not gonna use mechanical forces necessarily. We are going to use the body's own ability to basically almost heal itself. For instance, the tongue is your most powerful muscle in your body. Well, what if we could use that tongue to our advantage to create that growth and development that we need? Well, we've created an appliance that will be able to promote that growth and development. What if we can promote and guide the development of the incoming teeth in order to expand the arches to the greatest ability or to the ideal position where those arches should be? Again, we have appliances that guide these teeth in and allow for the expansion of the dentition. At the same time, as the teeth are developing, guess what? Those fiber bundles are developing into that position, which eliminates the ability for relapse. Um, we've also created the proper habits. We have myofunctional therapy built into the appliance that basically with every swallow the child has, we're recreating that therapy and providing those changes to occur just while the child sleeps. So it's a, a really fantastic. We also promote the forward growth of the um, lower third of the face. We get 54% more lower growth than we do in control samples. So it's extremely effective if we can catch the child during their growing years. So let's talk a little bit more about airway. So on the left-hand side, this is two different five-year-olds. This is what we're talking about, a restricted airway. You can see the narrowness of that airway. We know that 21% of the population will have a constricted airway. The child on the right does have a normal airway, which is great. However, there is another problem that can occur, and that is this is the same five-year-old, but on the image on the left, a nice airway. Look what happens to the airway when we mouth breathe. Again, half a half inch of open um, mouth breathing can create six millimeters of reduction in the airway. So even though a patient might have um, a normal airway, we are not out of the woods because habitual issues can obviously create um, a compromised situation. Here's a very interesting case that was used with the Healthy Start treatment. And um, the image on the left is basically the initial image of this patient. Um, we do have um, guidelines to determine 
what would be the accepted um, measurement of the airway at various ages, um, basically starting at age five. And that is we take the age of the patient times 10. So this particular patient happens to be nine years old. So we look at nine times 10, which is 90 square millimeters. And we realize that this patient is compromised. He's at 53.6 square millimeters. So we put in the um, have a corrector, which is the first appliance within the series of Healthy Start appliances. And he wore it for one month, and we took a second CBCT scan. You'll see the appliances in the mouth. We're trying to determine what type of increase in the airway are we creating. You can see that we created 337 square millimeters, which is six times what we had before. But what makes this absolutely <laughs> earth shaking is that in our growth span at age 17 we actually peak in our growth of our airway typically our goal is to reach between 150 and 170 square millimeters bad news is at age 21 our airway starts to deteriorate for the rest of our lives so the question especially in adult patients that have sleep apnea we ask ourselves uh, they're compromised, but did they ever reach their full potential at age 17? Or is the 150 to 170 square millimeters not sufficient to last us for the rest of our lives? Um, those answer, those, the, the answer to that question has not been um, determined. However, if an airway can be created that is 337 square millimeters, that's over double what we would anticipate at the peak of growth, does it really make that much significance if our airway deteriorates after 21? I don't know. We're right now conducting six different research projects in regard to these issues and identifying um, what this looks like, stability after 15 years, and um, what kind of averages we can provide for you. So it's a huge breakthrough and um, really changing the trajectory of our patients in regard to treatment at that age. So just reviewing, obviously we're looking at mouth breathing and snoring. We know that these issues will um, many times be created from extended bottle feeding and pacifier use, um, causes poor tongue position and abnormal swallowing. Sugar processed foods can be, um, have effect Poor oral habits, especially thumb, finger, lip sucking, tongue thrust, etc. From mouth breathing and snoring, we basically create a compromised airway. And this compromised airway reduces airway, restricts airflow, reduces oxygen, increases CO2, affects brain function, immune and endocrine systems, swollen adenoids and tonsils, low tongue position, tongue thrust, underdeveloped dental arches, overjet, open bite, and crossbite. From a compromised airway, we can lead into sleep disorder breathing. And as we had provided the 27 outward symptoms are most prevalent, which include restless sleep, ADD, ADHD, bedwetting, chronic allergies, nightmares, etc. So you can see how the circle of events occur and basically how sleep disorder breathing basically is created. Um, here's an interesting research, and it talks about the brain function and how sleep impacts the ability to um, have adequate brain function. So the first three images on the top is basically after a normal um, night's sleep, and this is the MRI, so you can see the activity that's occurring. Now the last three images is brain function after one night of sleep deprivation. Um, if you look closely, um, we can see one little area here um, of brain function. So you can see how much sleep impacts um, the ability for the brain to um, perform properly. Um, I always look at this and think, oh my goodness, think about those all-nighters you pulled in college and how we all thought that that was really going to do the trick for those finals. Well, um, obviously not. Um, Maybe we should have closed those books and gone to bed a little bit earlier. Anyways, okay, so now let me talk to you a little bit about Healthy Start, what we do, how we do it, why we do it. 
Um, we've been doing this for over 50 years, 52 plus years, and four mil over 4 million children treated worldwide. Um, the reason why I bring that up is we work very hard and um, have been able to collect so much data in regard to growth and development anatomy. We, within our system, provide our providers the ability to even take a profile and we have created a template of what the um, age-specific profile should look like, where a child should be in their growth and development. And we're able to actually pinpoint where that deficiency is and how much deficiency there is. Um, it, it, it's a tremendous way for us to um, be able to gauge where a child is, look at the deficiencies, but then provide the proper a treatment plan and system for that child to gain maximum growth and development, um, maximum improvement with their habits, um, create the proper habits, create the expansion, and as I always say, frosting on the cake, we're going to straighten the teeth at the same time. Um, with the Healthy Start system, um, you can see the breakdown. So um, the first appliance in this is pretty much age specific, and this is typically skeletal age. Um, so for instance, if you have a child walking into your office at age five, they would typically fall under the kids system. And the kids system basically is comprised typically of three appliances. And the appliances each have a different function and guides the child through their growth and development. Um, we will typically see a child up until age 12. Um, active treatment is typically about a year and a half to two years. And then we will continue monitoring that case um, with just passive nighttime wear for the child. And typically you see them at their six month cleanings and just evaluate to make sure all of the dentition is able to erupt in properly and be guided so that the case um, basically finishes up very nicely. Um, Healthy Start, our youngest patients are 13 months. Our oldest patient is 84. So we, we basically go through the spectrum. I know we're specifically focusing on pediatrics, but we do adults as well. Obviously, with adults, um, we have no more growth. So we need to make sure what we're addressing, we're addressing appropriately. And we also have to manage expectations because typically, um, the appliances might need to be worn every night in order to eliminate the mouth breathing and the um, sleep issues that they have. Um, I think the last statistic is about 50% were able to maintain that um, ability without the use of appliances. But I'm always a little bit hesitant. I'd rather um, Oh, uh, under promise and over deliver, um, especially with my adult patients. But it is amazing. Um, we're able to really work on promoting that growth and development. We look at um, TMJ issues. We look at um, intercuspation of the teeth, overbite, overjet corrections, um, obviously creating the proper habits um, and providing nasal breathing. So it, it's an excellent system even at an older age. So Healthy Start addresses root causes by expanding the dental arches, establishing nasal breathing, training the tongue, eliminating bad habits, advancing the mandible to correct overjet, encouraging proper facial and body growth, and correcting most orthodontic problems. So let's take a look at the habit corrector, and this is the first appliance in the series with the built-in myofunctional therapy. So if you take a look at the appliance, you can see the different features. And these all occur and are all being um, addressed just during a child swallow. So they can simply wear it passively at night and be able to address this. So the first, we have palatal tabs. The palatal tabs are actually going to help us with expansion. Typically with this first appliance, we will see approximately one to three millimeters of expansion. And then when we move into the second appliance, um, we can correct up to about four millimeters of expansion. So if we time it properly, obviously you can't dictate when those patients come into your office, but if we hit it 
just right, the maximum amount of expansion in the arches we can gain is about 6.7 millimeters. So it's pretty significant. Um, we also have a ramp, and the ramp is designed so every time the child swallows, the tongue is lifted and it's positioned up into the palate of the mouth, um, and it is allowed to rest there. So we're increasing the nasal breathing. We prevent tongue thrust with these prongs. We also have um, tabs on the lower portion to prevent that lower chin from drifting back. Um, we have a high margin, so it prevents the mouth breathing and encourages the nasal breathing. We can actually have pads um, specifically for that patient, and the pads will basically help close those open bites more quickly. Um, how do we determine how well our child is placing their tongue, if they have a low-lying tongue, or if they have an improper swallow? Um, I would suggest that every appointment have a um, glass of water there so that you can um, watch that child um, swallow. When we see a child swallow, the only movement we should see is in the neck. If we see facial muscles um, squinting or moving, it means the tongue is in the wrong position and that swallow is not incur or occurring properly. Um, as we go through treatment, we will watch that child swallow at each appointment and record where they are and how much facial movement has occurred. And you'll see the um, transformation that is occurring um, just because of that myofunctional therapy built into these appliances. Um, it is really amazing um, the rate of swallow. So during the day, we will swallow two times a minute. During night, we swallow one time a minute. So using the HAVA corrector, um, just at night, we basically are um, providing at least 480 swallows. So it is extremely effective. Um, it is, um, occurs with no additional therapy. Um, if you are fortunate enough to have a myofunctional therapist at your disposal, um, absolutely include them. Um, the problem, myofunctional therapy is a great way of helping children um, and adults. The problem is the cooperation. And I think the most recent study showed maybe 1% cooperation. It, it's, it's pretty low. Um, this way, you're guaranteeing it. You're allowing that child to wear that appliance and knowing that you're getting that much repetition each and every night. So the changes that happen are um, incredibly quick. Um, here is a study that was done on 220 patients, and they wore the first appliance only, and it was within the first five months. And we wanted to know exactly how much correction we get in each area and what we would anticipate with your patient. So if we're not getting it, we know we need to be looking um, at other things. So for instance, headaches. We found that 18% of the sample had headaches, which was 40 patients. 98% of the cases had improvement. 94% was the mean correction of those with improvement. 91% was the mean correction of the entire sample. And 85% of the cases had 100% correction. So you can go through the different outward symptoms and you can see the percentage of corrections and what that looked like. Here's an extremely interesting conversation, ADD and ADHD and sleep disorder breathing. So what makes this so interesting is that the ADD and the ADHD um, criteria that is used to determine a child's, um, whether or not a child has um, ADD and ADHD is actually the same criteria we use to determine on um, sleep disorder breathing. They have the same characteristics, the same areas of questioning. So um, can these two diagnoses be misdiagnosed? Absolutely. Um, right now, the statistic is 85% of the children with ADD and ADHD have sleep issues. Um, what that means is, are we, uh, my philosophy is that when we have a child that exhibits ADD and ADHD behaviors, evaluate sleep first. Um, if we're able to rule out or to um, provide 
um, treatment to address the sleep disorder breathing. Maybe all of the ADD and ADHD behaviors would go away, or maybe majority of them. However you look at it, sleep plays a huge role in these behaviors. And if you can eliminate the sleep portion of it, see where the child lands and see um, what changes happens with that child. Um, obviously, um, there has been studies. One of the largest study was Karen Bonick. She did it on over 13,000 patients. She found that sleep disorder breathing increases the risk of ADD and ADHD by at least 50%. ADD and ADHD patients have little or no REM sleep, but have delta sleep. Patients without ADD or ADHD have primarily REM sleep and delta sleep. In the study that we did of over 500 patients, we found that ADD and ADHD was present in 25.2% of the cases. Um, here are some statistics. Um, in regard to ADD and ADHD, 50% of the children who are diagnosed with ADD and ADHD are held back one grade. 30% are held back two grades. Well, if that child has sleep disorder breathing, it doesn't matter if you hold them back 10 grades, they're still going to have the same issues. So again, going back to the equation, possibly evaluate sleep first. See where the child lands. Unfortunately, also, sleep impacts a child's IQ. So studies reveal that children with sleep disorder breathing, their IQ can be reduced by 10 to 20 points. And each point is valued at $170,000 over a lifetime of a child. So you can see the impact that sleep can have within a child's life. So it's imperative for you to at least identify, educate, and provide the information to the parents to make the proper choices for their children. Um, you have the tools, you are the experts in growth and development of the oral cavity. So let's show, let's evaluate how Healthy Start promotes growth and development. As we all know, normal cranial facial growth um, tends to be close to um, the end of development by age 12. That's where our numbers come in because we're trying to work with growth and development. And typically we're talking about skeletal age here. Um, if you look at the statistics at age 12, 89% of males have completion of growth and 94% of the females. So we want to make sure that we're addressing it as early as possible. I would also want you to take a look at the growth. If you take a look here, the growth is down and forward. We want to mimic what nature would intend. Typically, we are looking at the forward development. Um, and increasing that or basically providing the appropriate amount of growth that should occur if everything went 100%. That's why we talk about being able to provide growth and development in a natural arena, meaning that we are promoting those um, occlusions, the upper arch and the lower arch to be in that forward direction. Um, and being able to occlude properly, intercuspation, correcting the overbite, correcting the overjet, open bite, gummy smile, class three, cross bites. These are all areas of compromise that occurs. And if we can eliminate it, we can allow the growth to move forward. Here's the child that was treated with Healthy Start. You can see the before, see the deficiency, open mouth. You can see how retronathic the lower um, the mandible is. Um, you can obviously see how much growth is necessary. Circles under her eyes. Um, here she is a year and a half la later at age seven. You can see the forward growth. You can see the changes. Um, the study, we did one in Finland um, with three cities. It was a very large orthodontic study and found that 54% more lower growth in the jaw was provided by Healthy Start appliances than we would see in a control sample. Um, some other areas that we have, we have special appliances that have been designed to even further introduce and promote that forward growth. Um, one is called the Max-A, Maxillary Advancer. So we are not only um, bringing the upper jaw forward, but also the lower jaw. They work in unison. So there are no walls in the upper arch. 
the tabs are provided so it is promoting the tongue to push that upper arch in a forward direction and the lower portion is basically providing and guiding along with it. Here's an example of just a, a child that was in it for three months, typically they're in it for two to four months. Um, they started at the initial one month progress, here they are, and then they'll move right into the habit corrector and the rest of the appliances as they go through the system. We also look at class three, obviously they're skeletal and pseudo. We can um, address the pseudo um, class three um, deficiencies. Um, in skeletal, we say we minimize. It's difficult with the skeletal, depending on the age of the child, how severe it is, um, but we can definitely minimize that skeletal three and obviously correct the pseudo. So here you can see, um, an initial and the after of the class three. Same design, no frontal wall, tabs designed to push that upper arch in a forward direction. There is a lower bumper on the lower portion to hold the lower arch while we're driving the upper arch in a forward direction. Once it, the jump occurs, then they move into the next appliance and we go through the system. So treatment planning, we are here to assist you. We want to make sure that each and every child is looked at as thoroughly as possible. We provide a um, treatment planning um, process with you. We ask for information about that patient. We will provide a suggested treatment plan that will help you decide what appliances, when to use them, what we anticipate seeing, um, what is the prognosis for the, kid, for the child, as well as um, the duration of treatment. So here's the fun. Let's try and look at some of these um, cases. Here's a case. This child actually um, had, had a tonsil ectomy. Um, tonsils and adenoids removed two months prior to the sleep questionnaire. And as you can see, I believe there's 23 um, outward symptoms that the parent indicated. And out of those 23 symptoms, they scored 73 on that. That is a very severe case. Now, the child wore the first appliance for two months, and this is the follow-up to that. So out of the 23 symptoms, the child now has seven. And out of a score of 73, that child is down to a score of seven, just within two months. It's a huge, huge change for that child. At the same time, you'll see that the child had speech problems. The parent even wrote very delayed speech, didn't say many words up until age three or four. And you can see how much the speech improved with utilization of this first appliance. So now let's take a look at what that child looked like. So as you can see, you can see uh, slight circles under the eyes. You can see a little deficiency of the lower third. But if you look internally, look at that deep bite. Look at the squareness of the arch. These are all indications that there are other issues happening. So here he is in March of 2015 one year later, almost like a different child. I want you to also look at the proportion of the face. We want to typically see the third, 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 and each one being equivalent. If you go back, um, you would notice that the lower third was quite deficient, um, mainly due to a deep overbite. So look at here, now he is a year later, no overbite. You can see the roundness of the arches, um, obviously, the circles have gone. He looks just a totally different child. So let's show you the stability and the development of the other occlusion, the other um, dentition. Here he is in 2018. You can see proportion looks great. You can see his dentition, overbite held. Look at the roundness of both the upper and lower arch. Great case. So that's kind of the process that goes on. We can take a look at a few other pictures. Here's one that, here's the initial, again, a very deep bite. Outward symptoms, yes, quite a few. You see fives, threes, um, some fours. Um, take a look two months later. Um, I think here's one. One outward symptom left. Um, you can see the differences in the progress. This child is not done. Obviously, we're watching for the rest of the dentition to develop, and again, passively at night. Here's the initial of another patient. Here's the finish. Here's the comparison of the two cases.
all done with these appliances, typically worn at night. Sometimes if there's more permanent teeth, we'll ask them to wear it um, maybe one to two hours during the day and night for a short period of time, usually two to 12 months, depending on the degree of severity. Here's the process. You can see the initial very deep bite. They wore the initial appliance, it fits in. You can see the permanent teeth start to erupt. They're angulated. It's captured by the appliance. They're designed to rotate, guide the dentition in properly, correct the uh, functional problem. And here they is at the final, and here's the appliance and how they fit into it. Here's another initial and finish. Here's another initial and finish. Here's an interesting case. Um, her mother was 37 when ended up having to have jaw surgery and saw that the same features and the same problems she had as a child were being repeated in her own child. So you can see, take a look at the third, third, and very short in the lower third. You can see the circles under the eyes. You can see the rolled lip. Um, if we look intraorally, very deep bite. You can see squareness of the arch. There's bruxing that's happening. So here she is. Let's look at her. Different kid. Again, look at the proportions of the face. No circles under their eyes. Look at the occlusion. Look at the roundness of the arches. Now let's see how stable and settled the case becomes. Here she is. Here she is again. Here's another case, snored, Brock's bad breath, ear infection. About a year later, still in the process, continuing the treatment. Here's another case. You can see outward symptoms of sleep. Two months later, there's still some ones um, that will continue. Um, you can see the deep bite. You can see the squareness of the arch and now you can see the changes that have occurred. Here's another child spectrum um, of outward symptoms, snored, brux, mid-treatment, final, 14 years later. We are have high compliance rate with our appliance, 94%. And part of that is because um, I guess 52 years of experience has given us a little bit of an upper hand on compliance and understanding how to talk to parents, how to talk to patients, um, how to make a healthy start a fun, um, exciting treatment for these kids. Um, we'll talk about how we get that. Um, that's part of what our digital class is about. That's part of what our live classes are. We talk a lot about how we look, what we do at each appointment, how do we motivate. But the app plays a great role in it because it's a fun tool. Um, the child each morning will be able to indicate if they wore the appliance, if it stayed in all night. They do get um, a coin that they can deposit in the bank, and they do get 30 minutes of game time or reading a book or whatever they want to do. At the same time, um, each appliance comes with cheek retractors, and on Fridays they'll take a selfie and we'll be able to um, create almost a flip book for the parent, um, for the patient, because um, believe me, they always forget where they came from, and they're always shocked to see what the change is, even from a week-to-week -week, um, segment of time. What makes this so interesting is all of this information is then processed and put into your own portal. So before each appointment, you're able to access this information. Um, a parent will also update the sleep questionnaire, so you'll have a up-to-date um, situation of that child's outward symptoms. So imagine when they come in for their appointment, how um, more effective that appointment is, because you know what that patient's been doing for the previous four weeks or six weeks or however long that time is. So um, you can talk about other things with the parents. Um, it's very effectual. Um, parents love to see the black and white. They want to see the changes. They want to see exactly what's going on with their child's growth and development. And there's no better way than um, to have it documented in something similar to an app. So again, we've treated over 4 million cases. Um, our appliances are FDA cleared, no latex, no plasticizers. Um, all appliances are BPA, BPS free, phthalate free, no silicone. 
um, we regulate ourselves to a class two medical device, meaning that the appliances are safe enough to be put into the body. Obviously, we're not going to do that, but we want you to under understand our dedication. Um, we basically assume your patients are our own children. We are not going to do something to your own child that we wouldn't do to our own child. So we want to make sure that um, you realize how serious we take um, safety and um, being able to provide you with the best product that we can um, provide and the safest. Um, so with that, I think um, I'm going to hand it over to Susie. Um, I don't know if we have any questions, but I'll be more than happy to answer whatever we have. Yeah, there actually are a couple of questions, Leslie. The first question is, um, so the question is, what do you suggest we do if we wanted to put a patient in the, for example, habercrocter appliance, but their nose is stuffed and they're not able to breathe? Um, she's asking, you know, assuming that, um, would you go to an ENT? Would you go to a myofunctional therapist? What would you be your suggestion um, to start a child who is having those issues? So it's a great question. So there are basically three areas that we want to make sure that we're evaluating prior to even starting any Healthy Start system or any system to be really quite honest. Um, we're gonna take a look at tonsils and adenoids. And um, what I would suggest is sometimes when we evaluate, we look at the vertical. I want you to put the child horizontally and see if those tonsils are touching. We call them kissing tonsils. If they are, that child should be referred to an ENT. Um, the other thing is we will have them um, try breathing through their nose. So we play a simple game, seal their lips and see between you and the patient who can breathe through their nose the longest. If a child absolutely cannot and is gasping for air, um, there might be an obstruction, a nasal obstruction. Again, probably refer to an ENT. Um, with a child that has a stuffy nose, that is part of what we see typically with a child that's experienced sleep disorder breathing. And the reason being is that um, they're breathing through their mouth, they're getting irritations into the body, the nose is running, they're getting infections, and we just need to clear that out. So if a child typically has just a runny nose or a stuffed up nose, um, my suggestion would be, obviously, every time we go to put the appliance in the mouth, I would basically make sure that they blow their nose as well as they can. And I won't leave it up to their um, device to determine what's a good blow and not a good blow. I would actually work with them in your office, say, let me see you blow your nose. And typically, they'll take a Kleenex and like dab their nose. No, 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 no. We want to blow your nose to get everything out. Um, there are other different washes you can get to help you do that. Um, that is absolutely a great idea as well. And if the child still says, I'm really nervous about wearing it at night just because of my um, stuffed up nose, I would have that patient start wearing it one hour during the day and make the goal for the first month just wearing it one hour each day. Just by doing that, the body is going to start feeling better and it's going to start making those changes. And once they feel that they're able to significantly feel comfortable with the appliance, breathe properly, um, and um, without strain, then I would have them wear it at night. So hopefully that answers your question. We'll obviously go into much more depth um, during our courses because these are the questions that we want to help you um, in response to your patient's needs. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nelson was asking, um, really loved all of the slides and was just curious how he could see them again. Um, so just so you know, this act, this webinar has been recorded. So everybody who has attended will make sure um, get sent a, a copy of you know, the video. You can also visit our YouTube channel. It's um, if you go onto YouTube and type in Healthy Start Child, you'll be able to find our channel and you can watch several videos there as well as some of the previous medical webinars that we've done as well. Just thought, thought I'd mention that. So, okay, so I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about, I'm going to share my screen really quickly. There we go. I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about our education program. Um, you know, the education program that we, that Healthy Start has in place is 
extremely important. You know, we, we work with a lot of um, pediatricians. We are, ENTs are referring to our Healthy Start providers. We, we have this connection with the medical community. And um, be, what they, one of the things that they absolutely love is the education that our providers have. And so we actually um, have our doctors as well as staff members go through a really great comprehensive training. And I like to call it a three-pronged training because it really is three different types of, of learning for you guys. Now, it starts out with what we call our digital education course. It's a seven session digital education course. And the, what I love about this is you can really join this from anywhere in the world. I mean, we have doctors from all over the world who join our education course. And the way that it works is every Monday we send out a video to your email, and, and this includes you and all of your staff members as well. You have the entire week to watch the video. Now the video is only about an hour and a half long, but it's over some fantastic subjects that you'll wanna learn about, and I'll get into those in a few minutes. Um, but you have the entire week to watch the video series, and then every Friday, we have a live interactive study club. The study clubs are fantastic because we have specialists that join us for each study club. So you'll have a doctor, um, a certified trainer on board who will talk about the, um, the highlights of the video that you watch throughout the week. You'll wanna write down your questions because you can ask them live, just like like you did tonight, you can ask those questions live during that study club, get all your questions answered. Even your staff members, again, as well, who might be joining you on that study club can ask their questions. Um, but we also have specialists that join us that talk about everything from billing, you know, how to organize Healthy Start in your office. We talk a lot about marketing and we talk a lot about educating the parents in your community because that's the goal. The key is, you know, once you have this ed education, once you're certified, we want to make sure that you understand understand how you can reach as many parents, as many, help as many children as possible. So all of that is covered in this digital education course. Now that's the first part of the training. So the first part is digital. The second part is we give you two free cases. We want to give you hands-on training as well. I mean, we understand that, you know, many doctors are hands-on visual learners. So we want you to work with two patients while you're taking the course. So you have two different age groups. You have a four to six year old and you have a seven to 11 or six to 11 year old. So that that way you have these two different um, children, these two different age groups that you can work from start to finish. And we're going to give you everything you need. We're going to give you the appliances that you need for that child. We're going to give you a treatment plan. And this is a, you know, with, with every single one of our cases, you receive a detailed, I know Leslie went over this, but that detailed treatment plan um, where we're going to walk you through um, the treatment from start to finish. So it takes all the guesswork out of it. It comes with the specialty appliance case for your for that, for that patient. It comes with that Healthy Start mobile app. So all of that, um, two full treatments are included in the course. So that's your hands-on portion. You're also going to get a voucher to come to a live course as well. We're gonna include that as well because this way you can sit in a classroom also and you can even bring four of your staff members. So as I mentioned, it's a three-prod training. So it's pretty cool. You're gonna receive a sample acrylic stand so that you can, with sample appliances for your office. Um, as I mentioned, it includes all of your staff members. And the great thing about this is that our course actually complements that ADA policy that Leslie was talking about earlier on sleep-related breathing disorders. Now, the course actually starts January the 6th, so it's perfect timing for you guys. And as I mentioned, some of these video series that you're going to receive, you're, you're going to be training on um, sleep-related breathing disorders, how to identify it in your patient, but also in how to increase your patient flow, which is really important. Um, you receive 18 CE PACE credits for attending the digital portion of the course, and then you receive 16 more when you come out and you uh, attend one of our destination courses. And we have a great lineup of destination courses all over the country, so it's really fantastic. So how, I, I wanna tell you a little bit about some of the, some of the things that other doctors are saying about our course, so we had a doctor in Australia who attended. He said the course was excellent. All at Healthy Start have really got their act together and offer resources others strive for but rarely achieve. Well-organized, 
passionate and supportive. We had a doctor in Canada who joined who said, I want to thank you and your colleagues for this amazing course. I've been searching for a solid system to help my patients, and this is by far the best, most organized, comprehensive course I've taken. A doctor in Colorado, I really enjoyed the course. We've identified quite a few patients that will benefit from Healthy Start. My business partner's four-year-old is in the habit corrector because he has had swallowing problems, and we've already seen great improvement in his eating. We already have three more patients who are ready to start next week. We can't wait to see their progress. That I love because Dr. Wright, she was three weeks into the course. I, I mentioned it's a seven session um, digital course. So she was three weeks in and she already had patients lining up on her door. And the reason that can happen is because we're actually going to send you the two habit correctors that you need for those patients immediately. So the second you join the course, the second you watch that first session, um, you're ready to hand out that those habit correctors. By the time you get to the third week, those parents are already seeing a change in their children. They're seeing healthier kids. They're seeing children who are waking up without headaches, um, you know, just all of these different symptoms that are disappearing. And for a parent, that's huge. I mean, it's exciting and the child feels better. So next thing you know, they're telling the, uh, the parents that they know. And so that's kind of how it happens. And it just snowballs from there. Um, ADA took our course and said that it was absolutely ingenious. So that's pretty high praise, I think, from the American Dental Association. So financial metric, what is your startup cost analysis? So typically, it's $3,800 to attend the digital course and to attend the um, live course that I was talking about. And you get those two free cases, which is a huge deal. I mean, it's really amazing. Um, but because you attended our webinar tonight, and I know a lot of you, we met out at the Greater New York Dental Meeting, we are actually offering this as our um, show special for $3,400. Um, so we're act so it's typically $3,800. We're giving you that live course at no cost. So you can do everything for $3,400. So the digital, the live course, the digital, remember, includes all your staff members. The live course is you and three staff members, and then also your um, two free cases. So pretty amazing deal. It's really, really simple to get started. And, and really now is the time, you know, it, this is one of those things that once you know this information, you, you can't unknow it. So every child that you see, you're going to see these symptoms. You're going to see the dark circles. You're going to notice those narrow palates. You're going to see these things. And to know that there is a treatment that can help those kids, it, it yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to want to move forward. And, and I think that that's one of the things that I find all the time is that, you know, there's so many education courses out there, which is great. I mean, it's fantastic that this is, you know, out there now that, you know, I think doctors are starting, starting to understand more than ever that sleep is an issue and especially in children. But the problem is, is that all of those education courses that are out there, there's never a solution. So we have the solution. And so now's the time. Really simple to get started. You can visit openairwaydentistry.com and you'll notice that there's several register now buttons. Just click the register now button. You'll just fill out your information and you can pay right there. You're all set. You'll receive a welcome package in the mail um, shipped to your office. It'll have that acrylic stand. It'll have your habit correctors, the first two appliances that you need for those um, two children that you're going to want to start out um, treating. So you'll get all of that in the mail. Now, if you have any questions and you'd like that you like to have answered before you move forward. My email address is slafredo at thehealthystart.com. Please feel free to email me and I can answer any questions that you have or I can push you in the right direction to get those questions answered. Um, so Leslie, is there anything else that you'd like to add before, uh, before we say goodnight? Um, I just want to tell you that um, thank you for being patient with us and spending the evening with us, but um, really the importance is that you start looking at these kids a little differently. Um, take a look around you. You'll be shocked how many kids you see. Um, and I just hope tonight was informative to you to make you feel like, wow, this is a new area in dentistry. Um, I feel that this will probably be the number one area in dentistry if it isn't already. Um, we realize the number of children that are affected and most importantly, we understand the role that each and every one of you play in um, eliminating, treating, diagnosing, evaluating, and screening for these issues. So um, congratulations. Hopefully this is an exciting evening for you. 
and hopefully it puts you in the right direction to help so many kids. So thank you again. Um, thank you, Susie. Um, always a great evening. And um, I look forward to um, sharing more time with you and um, talking more about airway health in children. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, Leslie, there actually was one, at just right when you were um, signing off, there was an additional question that popped up, if, if you're okay. up for it. Um, so Dr. Ty, and, and this is something that we'll actually go over in the course, um, but he's just curious, what is the typical charge to the patient um, or the parent um, with, the, with the system? Um, great question. So we, we cannot dictate prices, but typically we see around 3700 is what the fee is um, to the patient. Um, it will take you about two to three hours of total chair time um, for the treatment. Obviously, it's spread over quite a few years, um, but it's um, it, it's a well worth um, value for a parent. They look at it possibly as um, something they can use instead of orthodontics, traditional um, bands and brackets. Um, so there is a reduced cost, but we're doing so much more. We're treating the health of the child. Awesome. Thank you so much. That is all of our questions for tonight. I'd like to say thank you so much to everybody who took time out of their evening to learn about this important topic. And Leslie, thank you so much for your time this evening as well. Have a great day evening. And again, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Take Bye care, everyone. everyone. See you. Bye-bye.